The intricate dance of particles unfolds amidst the symphony of angular momentum. Here, Levi Civita orchestrates the dynamic interplay between angular momentum and two essential quantities, position and linear momentum. Get ready to embark on a captivating and utterly tedious journey through the intricate web of commutator relations and quantum mechanics. Through meticulous calculations, we'll unveil the not-so-hidden, but hidden in plain sight relationships between fundamental quantities, paving the way for deeper insights. These revelations will illuminate the interconnectedness of angular momentum and their components, showcasing an elegant symmetry underlying quantum mechanics. These inquiries will provide insights into the behavior of angular momentum in more complex quantum mechanics systems, just like what we have here. This problem is asking us to do quite a bit of work with the following commutator relations, where we have to find six commutator brackets in part A between uh, angular and the position vector and linear momentum. We have to find another commutator bracket with two linear or two angular momentums. C, we have to find a commutator of linear momentum with some squares. And then D, we have to finally showcase how the Hamiltonian commutes with all three components of L. So that being said, let's make a game plan for how to tackle this. Clearly in part A, if you read it from the textbook, this had six parts. We can summarize this in two brackets. We have the third component of the angular momentum, LZ, and we want to show the commutator with all three components of R and all three components of the linear momentum. So J would span from one to three. In part B, we just want to show how two angular momentum components commute with one another, or if they do at all. And then in C, we have to find what the third component is with both of the position and the momentum squares are. That'll lead us directly into part D, where we have to show what the commutator is for all position or all uh, indices or all components of the angular momentum with P squared. And of course, since the Hamiltonian has a uh, potential term, we need to find what all three components of the angular momentum do with this potential. So quite a bit to deal with, and let's dive in. The first stop naturally would have to occur with the first component of the position vector. As denoted here, we have L3 and R1. Both represent the third and first components respectively. That being said, since the indices represent the component you're on, we know that L3 is equal to LZ, and we know that from the cross product that is equal to X, PY minus Y, PX, and the first component of R gives us X. Easy enough, we can handle that. We notice here that we have a minus sign here, so we can use linearity to split up this commutator set. And now we have two commutators. But notice that we have a product here and a product here, both on the left-hand side. So we can use the left-hand distributivity law and get a set of two more commutators each. So now the one commutator goes to one, two, three, four four commutators from one commutator. How in the world is that? Kind of messy. So this is what I mean when I said tedious in the opening. We have a lot of these to come. Uh, this would be a good segue to note that the PDF has all the nitty gritty in it, so check that out. Nonetheless, here we see we have a mixture of momentum, linear momentum and position, 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 momentum, position, and position, position. Thankfully, we saw back in chapter, or chapter one, question 4.1, that position with any other position element commutes, so it is zero. So xx goes to zero, yx goes to zero, as indicated here and here. We also found that in order to evaluate the position and, uh, or excuse me, the momentum and position, we need to switch the order at the cost of a negative sign seen here and here. And we also saw that from 4.1, if we want to plug in these values, we know that R and P commute to I H bar delta I J. So we plug in the delta, which is the Kronecker delta. With that being said, we see that we have a blue and a red. So that tells us we have a first component, second component. Here we have a, uh, or we have a uh, X X, so blue, blue. So that tells us we have two first components. The Kronecker delta tells us that we only have something uh, if the indices match. So the one, two here goes to zero, indicate it there. 
and the one one here evaluates to one as seen here from there we simplify down and we see that the negatives cancel leaving us with i h bar y and thus we conclude that lz the third component uh, commuting or commutator with x leaves us with an i h bar y notice here how this is a three a one and a two this is what we call an even permutation and this is what the levi civita will encapsulate and will show more of its power very soon pressing forward then we now move on to l3 and r2 the second component naturally we have a little bit of insight now so we can bully through these and speed run through them if you want the full again go check out the pdf that being said we know what l3 is put it in we see immediately that we know that the um uh, the double positions are going to uh cancel to zero cancel to zero after we distribute them and so what we need to do is evaluate the Dirac delta or the Kronecker delta, excuse me, of PYY and PXY. You see we get a YY here, so a 2, 2 there, an X and a Y. So we get a, um, once we flip them, we get a 2, 1. So not matching indices, that goes to 0. Matching, so that goes to 1. And you see we have a negative sign. Notice here that we have an L, Y, X. Pretty similar to what we had last time, but now we have a minus sign. That's because this is a three, a two, a one, and that is an odd permutation. Keep this in mind as we move through, and we'll highlight this again very soon. Uh, just be aware that this is a systematic structure that can be encapsulated with the Levi Civita symbol. Moving on, I think we have an insight on what this is gonna be. The uh, third component and the third component, Z and Z. Well, distribute it just like we did before, and you see R, 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 they cancel, so that goes to zero, zero. That is nice to know. Here we have delta Y, Z, or excuse me, delta Z and Y, so a three, two, and here we have a three, one. So naturally, no matching indices, they go to zero, and we conclude that there. That being said, we now reach our first checkpoint where we showed that a, com a component of L, the angular momentum, and what, they, uh, what the commutator relations is for all components of R for J equal one, two, three. Moving on then, stop number two leads us straight to the first component of momentum. Easy enough. We're gonna have a similar kind of hindsight come in because we plug in the L3 component, the angular momentum component for Z, just like we did with the position, except now we have PX, PX, PX. Left-hand distributivity, we see that we get a long distributive chain like this, but we also showed back in problem 4.1 that any components of P uh, commute with one another, so their commutator relation is zero. So remember, position, position equals zero, momentum, momentum equals zero, and now we are only having to deal with the cross uh, terms where we have the uh, deltas. So XX, X and PX, excuse me, Y and PX. Notice the uh, indice matching, indice matching, that goes to zero, that goes to one, and we end up in a happy spot of IH bar PY. Not too bad. Let's go ahead and knock out the other few. So now we move on to uh, L3 with P2. Same idea. Momentum, momentum, cancel. We have to set up the chronic delta, chronic delta. We do that. One, two goes to zero. Two, two goes to one. We end up with the uh, negative IH bar PX look at the negative sign yet again our insight tells us that l3 and p3 is an equal zero again we see that we don't have any matching indices so that gets us to zero not too bad and that brings us to the total checkpoint of two commutator relations done for all i uh, for all j for one through three easy enough now we can move on to part b all right doing so we have a you know, now that we have our head wrapped around what's going on, we can clearly power through this one. We want now what is a angular momentum component commuting with an angular momentum component. And you might see some weird symmetries or maybe not it's symmetry is not the right word, but some weird relations going on because of how these things are set up. Notice here that both of these are composed of position and uh, linear momentum components. Here L1 is equal to Y PZ minus Z PY. We don't have to plug in uh, the components for LZ because then we'd have 
a uh, two by, so we'd have four commutators after linearity and then another double that. So we'd have eight commutators if we didn't. We already did the groundwork for LZ and how it commutes with everything in terms of the watt, in terms of the um, position vector and the momentum vector. So we don't need to plug in the components here. That would be a lot of wasteful time. That being said, let's go ahead and linearity and distribute it out. We see that we end up with this, but as we just showed, we have LZY, which we showed in part A was negative I H bar X. We have LZZ, LZ and PZ, which we saw went to zero. We had LZZ, which we saw went to zero. And we had LZPY, which we saw went to negative I H bar PX. Cool. So you noticing that these things tend to replicate something uh, where you have two indices lead to another one. Here, the Z and the Y lead to an X. Here, the ZY lead to an X. ZZ leads to nothing. ZZ leads to nothing. Again, be aware of these patterns because it does come full circle. Uh, maybe pun intended. I guess we'll see. But now just to simplify this out, we see everything has an I H bar X and a PZ. This just has a negative sign on it. This has a double negative from the linearity here. So cancel them out. Factor out the I H bar. And we see here that we have a Z and a PZ, PX here from when we uh, put this plus sign first. And we have a minus X PX or PZ. So we put that second. Notice that ZX XZ gives us the LY and we're good to go. So we stay in the same realm here where we bring into account the um, IH bar and we get into another linear or uh, excuse me, angular momentum component. So that's pretty cool. Again, just take heave of notice that we have a three, one, and a two. So even permutation. That brings us to checkpoint two. And now that we have this done, we can move on to stop number four, which is part C. This brings us to, well, now we need to test the third component of angular momentum with the R squared. We know that the R squared here is equal to um, the X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And if we use linearity, we split this up quit, uh, quite fast, and we see that we end up with an xx, y, y, z, z. But here, I'm getting lazy and writing this out again. So here, what we see is that this goes to zero, regardless of how we distribute it because of the LZ, Z relationship. That's zero for everything, so to save us some time there. Nonetheless, we have a product on the right, so we could switch it with anti-symmetry, or we could simply use the... Um, the right hand distributivity rule and that's what I did here. So everything goes on the inside here and the inside here. Now you see we have an LZX, LZX, LZY, LZY. Guess what? Part A comes back again. We already showed what those were. So let's go ahead and plug them in. You see that everything here now has an IH bar term. I specifically color coded this because I don't want to keep carrying them around and I'm going to factor them out. Let's check out how this simplifies. Okay, so I factor out the IH bar from both, easy enough, and we see that we end up with a YX plus XY in that first one, and then a minus IH bar and then XY plus YX. Well, guess what? You could switch the order of the, uh, ang not the angular momentum, but the position vector coordinates. So YX is commutivity, it does commute with XY. I'm just rambling at this point, but you see by switching them, they cancel, so we end up with a zero there kind of nice actually really nice so we need to uh get now to our l3 part so or with the p squared part so sim following the same logic if we go to p squared py px squared py squared pz squared we saw that that went to zero follow the same line of reasoning distribute uh, and then we see here what happens after we distribute we solve for lz and all the position or mo linear so let me restart. We saw in part A that we found for LZ, the angular momentum. We saw for all components of the linear momentum with the commutator relation, so we can plug them in. Again, noticing that they have all IH bars, we factor them out, and they cancel perfectly. This brings us to our second checkpoint, or uh, excuse me, this brings us to the second part of C being concluded, so we get to our problem checkpoint where we now completed all of these relationships regardless of how messy they are. So they bring us to stop number five. Here, we are trying to determine 
if the uh, commutator is zero. Why are we trying to do this? Well, for commutivity, what we say is that AB equals BA. And if that's the case, AB minus BA, just pushing it over to the left-hand side, brings us to a zero. So if the commutator equals zero, then we know that these two things commute. So that's our goal here. We need to be aware of a couple of things in this setup though. Here we see that we have H and L, but L is a vector composed of three components. Let's also note that H being a P squared right here, that is also composed of three components. And R, or excuse me, V is a function of R. And if you remember from spherical coordinates, R is equal to the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. So we have a lot of things in the X, Y, Z directions that need to be categorized. Let's check out how that looks. Don't worry too much about this particular setup. I just want to highlight how gross it is whenever we expand how many different indice pairs that we have. For the first component or for the first operator, we have XX and then the, uh, so we have X pairing with X. For the uh, second pair, we have an X and a Y, X and Z. This is all reminiscent of what we did in uh, the table of 4.1. So definitely go look back at that and we see how gross it is. This tells us we have nine things to look for, but really we have more. If we go ahead and use linearity and or anti-symmetry first to reverse the order, since we know we just solved for everything where L was in the first position. Now we see that using that in linearity, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 different commutator relations to solve for. This is utterly gross, but let's look at some things and, and, and let's look at some things with a little bit of hindsight. See here, this column is all LX. This column is read conjoinable with P squared. That's what we do there. All LX, all with V, all LY. This reduces to P squared. L, Y, V, L, Z, P squared, L, Z, V, R. This is much cleaner and we see exactly what's needed. And if you didn't make this insight, you would be looking like one of these where they're really tired and really cranky and just at, at wit's end with a problem like this. Thankfully, we can use a little bit of insight and in using what we solved for in part C from B and A to go ahead and make this simpler, simpler. So let's go ahead and dive into this and clean it up. All right. So knowing that we are going to need a couple different components from this, namely, we only saw, we only proved for the LZ P squared. So we need to find the LX P squared and the LY P squared. And then for all components of L, we need to see, we need to see how they interact with V, where V is a function of R. That being said, if we extend the tables for all the L's and R relationships and all the L and P relationships, remember we only solve for L3 in both of these. We solve for everything in J for the L3 component, but now we need to put together the L1 and L2 components, which are summarized here. Every single pairing for L and R, every single pairing for L and P. This is ubiquitously gross and just a headache to memorize. I love highlighting this because these indices save us a lot of time, but sometimes it's nice to see how all the pairings come together. So you can memorize all this or use the power of the Levi Civita symbol. And here's where you can see the permutations coming together. So here we see that LIRJ follows the pattern IH bar where we have a plus or minus or zero with another R component, which is pretty fascinating. We put in angular momentum in R and we get out something with R, okay. Similarly for angular momentum and linear momentum, we have a output of linear momentum. So that's pretty cool. This is the time where I would say, notice that the fact that the Levi Civita takes on this three-dimensional tensor-like notation. So here, this is for all things X, all things Y, all things Z. Okay, pretty unanimous that this is, you know, a three-dimensional entity which we use often to highlight how things go together. And this is because most of these are zeros because we only care about the even permutations, which is highlighted here and here. 
and for three things for three indices we only have three pairs of those notice here in this nine element table that we only have three positive ones this one this one and this one okay that's why and we have three negatives this one this one this one everything else is zero so easy enough this is not something to be scared about but it's definitely something to be aware about so let's go ahead and apply these and save ourselves some headache all right first up on this um momentum train we have lx with p squared and we're going to do the same thing that we did with the lz p squared run it through with linearity we see that we have lx px goes to zero for every component so we don't care um we're not going to consider this in the pdf you can see the little more written out work i just don't think it's necessary here here though we do need to expand and use the distributivity rule on the py and pz so we get these combinations here if you don't believe me here is the lx px with the levi civita symbol and what we notice here is that uh, we have an xx which is a 1 1 and so we know that having a duplicate indice leads to zero because it's not an even or odd permutation and this is true for k equal one two or three remember that three-dimensional uh matrix or the tensor this is pain one pain two pain three that's why easy enough to see there now lx py this gives us an xy which is a first component second component so if we want something out of this, we need to have K equal three. And that gives us a Levi Civita of one, two, three. So here's how we read, oh, excuse me. Here's how we read the table. I have a one, then I go to a two, then I go to a three. This tells me I have a plus one. And so I put a plus one here, easy enough. And of course I'm zero if I'm K of any other value because then I would have repeated indices. So we only have one value there. And that's the one we're interested in. Here for LX and PZ, we have a first component and a third component. So if I want anything, I need to know that I can't have a one or three, so that has to be a two. And so this gives me a P2, which is PY. But notice here, I have a one through two. So I start at one, go to three, then go to two. That tells me I have a negative one. And that's where we see the negatives pop up. And of course, we're zero for all the other K values. And this is how we use these to construct it. The notation can definitely become cumbersome, but this is a lot better than writing out a couple nine by nine charts every time we're trying to do a calculation. That being said, we now see that once we plug these in, everything has an IH bar. Thank you for the momentum operators. And you see that here, this goes to PZ. So we have a PZ, PY, but over here we have a PZ as well. So, you know, we got to plug that in um and cancel away because of the pz and this py here the negative sign and we see the color coded canceling sign so beautiful we go to zero there easy enough we're going to run through the same process just for ly and p squared just to show you and we you know sure enough we get right back to zero as expected this brings us to our second to last checkpoint where we showed that for all components of angular momentum we can uh, what the commutator is with p squared so that's checked off easy enough that brings us to our final stop finally where we have to evaluate every single uh, angular momentum component with the potential which is a function of r okay again i'm highlighting that explicitly here but i'm going to drop it for the sake of spacing here we see that uh, lx is composed of a y and z so y p z minus z p y but we know that the linear momentum are operators too which are derivatives with h bar i h bar i and so on as you see here when we use linearity and we have to be careful about this because the linearity only works on the commutator bracket we still have to apply it to the test function f so apply the linearity and then apply the distributivity so where you have it here when you do so, understand that you had AB minus BA, where B is a function. So on the A side of things, whenever we um, distribute it out, we are going to have a product rule with V and F. Again, this is highlighted very explicitly and very tediously in the PDF, but that should be enough to let you know that 
These parentheses here are indicative of the product rule because of the product of V and F. So the first side of the distributivity is all product rule. The second side is just F hanging out or V hanging out while the derivative of F happens. But what we notice is that we have a Y, a DF, and a V. Here we have a V, Y, and DF. They cancel. Cool. Similarly here in the second product rule, we have a negative Z, F, and V. We have a Z, V, and a DF. So everything cancels out perfectly, or maybe expectedly at this point. But now we have to be really, really careful about what is meant by DV, DZ. Although we're able to cancel out the uh, derivatives since they're just the same quantity, here we see that dv dr needs to happen because in order to get to z from v, we have to go through r, and that's just a chain rule. So that's very cool. That's a very insightful trick. So let's go ahead, and now that we see that everything has a dv dr term in it and an f term, we'll left factor that and right factor that to this condensed form. So now everything hinges on what is dr dz and dr dy. And we know that from the definition of r, which is a square root here. If we apply this with the uh, power rule and chain rule, all that stuff, we get something that simplifies quite nice. So what happens then is we end up getting a chain rule of 2z, and then that 2 cancels with the 1 half from the power rule, so then we recombine a z over r for a z derivative, and that reduces to a y over r for the y derivative, and we see that those are the same darn components, so this cancels to zero. So that's wonderful. We see that this, that the uh, linear, linear, uh, or excuse me, the angular momentum operator cancels with the potential. That is astounding, only if it is a function of z or a function of r. And this is to say that it is uh, spherically symmetric. That will be important. So the other two follow suit, and you can see how they cancel here. So we can finally wrap this thing up. Again, recall that we are just trying to show that the commutator of the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum are zero. This brought us to setting up a table where we had to split up into exactly what it is we were trying to look for. And we found that these were the six component or six commutator relations we actually needed. So we already had this one, so we really just needed to find these two linear momentum ones and the uh, commutators with V for all components of L. And we saw that that led to a zero, this led to a zero. Well, then that led to a zero, that led to a zero, zero and zero. So in total, we got a zero for every single component of the angular momentum and the uh, Hamiltonian commutators. So we get a zero vector here. Thus, since I am zero for every component, I am zero with the vector itself. And we have successfully proven that H and L are uh, commu uh, commutable, so they are commutative, and we successfully proven what we needed to for this question. So now we throw our hands in the air and wave like we don't care because we just finally got where we needed to, and I was happy to see this result come to fruition. But that was a very messy problem, and this was a very uh, heavy thing to deal with. So let's wrap this up. As always, that was a fun question. A lot of a lot of leg work and a lot of uh, brute force, but I think we saw the importance of how other um, things can come in to make our lives simpler. In particular, the Levi Civita symbol and the cyclic permutations come together to make everything quite nice. And we saw that we were able to kind of browse through uh, part A, where we proved for a component of angular momentum the commutative relations for all components of the uh, position and linear momentum, and then on to B, where we showed how linear momentum interacted with linear momentum, followed by C, where we went into how the component, third component, acted with the squares of the position and momentum, which came into fruition and in helping us in part D, where we showed that for every component of L, we had a commutator relation with P squared, and more importantly, how L interacted with V, given that we had a spherically symmetric potential. That was fun, that was a lot of fun. Um, that being said, this took a while, so please consider supporting this channel by subscribing and sharing this curiosity. 
books, notes, and other reference materials are definitely going to be found below because there's a lot of fun things to reference here. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Some of the stuff is a headache. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, stay curious.